Pseudopod is extruded into this universe from a dimension of purest fear. It's beautiful in its own alien way, but what's to come will unsettle you. Pseudopod, episode 672, October 31st, oh yeah baby, 2019. This week's story, in regards to your concerns about your scare B&B experience, by Effie Seidberg, read by Eliza Chan, and the 2019 Halloween Parade, by Alistair Stewart, read by Alistair Stewart. And speaking as we were of Alistair Stewart, hello everyone, I'm your host, Alistair Stewart. This week we have two stories for you. One of them was recorded live for us at FantasyCon in Glasgow a couple of weeks ago, and I'm so happy we got this for all sorts of reasons. First of all, it's an Effie Cyborg piece, and Effie is both one of my favourite humans and favourite authors. Secondly, this, I believe, completes um, Effie's run through EA. I think she has now sold the story to all of us. And, most importantly, this is landing on Halloween, which is amazing. Even better... Your reader for this story is Eliza Chan. Eliza is a Scottish Chinese writer. She's been published in Fantasy Magazine, Fox Spirits, Asian Monsters, Persistent Visions, and Mythilla Review. She writes about East Asian mythology, British folklore, and mad women in the attic. She is amazing. She and Effie are extraordinary authors and extraordinary narrators. Again, this conflation of talent in one place has honestly made my day. And speaking of Effie, Effie is a fantasy and science fiction writer. Her stories can be found in the Women Destroy Science Fiction Special Edition of Lightspeed Magazine, The Best of Galaxy's Edge 2015-2017, Analog, and all the other EA podcasts, amongst others. In particular, Effie would like to draw your attention to the tale of Descruptinkin and the product launch requirements documentation over on Coast of Wonders. Effie lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. She likes to make sculpted cakes and bad puns and how the bad puns always great the cakes having eaten them good lord you have no idea it does my heart good to have such incredibly talented people on the show and i mean we'll get to the halloween parade in a minute but i just wanted to take a moment to highlight these two authors and just how amazing the work they do is and to thank them both for trusting us with their work and their voices Thank you, folks. This is an honor. This is a really good day in the office. So, without further ado, it gives me tremendous pleasure to remind you that Effie and Eliza have a story for you. And I promise you, it's true. In regards to your concerns about your scare B&B experience by Effie Cyberg, narrated by Eliza Chan. Dear Mrs. Axelthorpe, I'm so sorry to hear your family had a negative experience at our Scare B&B. While we aim to provide an atmosphere of family-friendly, spooky overnight fun, I see that with your family's unique experience, we've missed the mark. You're right. The blood dripping down the stairs to the abandoned attic was a slipping hazard. However, we did have signs clearly stating that guests should not go up to the abandoned attic stairs for precisely this reason. You'll be glad to know that the stains will eventually come out of your family's clothes with a little bit of bleach, but unfortunately the curse we use to keep the blood flow going is non-removable, and your clothing will continue to drip. After their arrival into the closed-off attic... I understand that your children were distressed by the sounds of our attic ghost. However, after reviewing the logs and interviewing the performer on shift, Alex of the Screeching Chains, it appears that the upsetting sounds were of Alex weeping after your offspring doused him in several cans of WD-40 and tried to set him on fire. We do encourage our performers to stay in character and will send him an appropriate reprimand once he's out of the hospital. While most of our guests are delighted by the hallway of knives and very pointy pendulums, I am disappointed that we did not meet your requirements for entertainment. That said, after our staff put out Alex's fire, they asked your children not to climb up the pendulum several times, as their weight would throw off the delicate balance of blade choreography. 
Despite this, they persisted on clambering all over the apparatus, which as a result disconnected and flew across the hall, decapitating our haunted knight. I understand your children were dissatisfied when they found the haunted knight staggering around looking for his head, amusing rather than scary. For this, I also apologise. You might be interested to know that the haunted knight will also make a full recovery after another few rounds of ectoplasm transfusion. I would also like to assure you that yes, all of our bats, rats and tarantulas have all been vaccinated. Whilst I'm deeply sorry that your wife was bitten, the critters only nip when provoked. I understand that setting the castle's tapestries on fire has a way of spooking them. In regards to the tapestries, they are enchanted to show the current guest's greatest fears. While I'm certain it is unsettling to have your own image appear in the magic needlepoint, unfortunately, I'm not able to determine who in your family is terrified of you. That said, we are grateful that you only burned the tapestries in the North Wing, as the South Wing's tapestries contain the threaded souls of the damned, and we don't want them getting out. Finally, I understand that while you were asked to leave the house for the firefighters to do their work, your family wandered into the nearby closed graveyard. Unfortunately, as this was merely the local graveyard and not part of the Scare b and experience, we cannot be held responsible for your experiences there. That said, yes, it can be disappointing that graves are only for the dead and not the undead, and I understand your children's frustrations that their desecration did not yield a more fruitful result. I can, on, I can also understand your consternation at the arrival of the local pitchfork-wielding mob. I'm sorry that this caused you to exit the premises and you were not able to avail yourself of our full overnight experience, complete with filly locking coffins lined with the finest rotting shrouds. For all of these, I'd like to assure you that your recent visit has been comped, and as per local regulation, we've notified the police. Best, Mr Swampy, Director of Scare B&B Customer Service and Volunteer Firefighter. P.S. While we are not able to offer you a discount on your next stay with us, as your account has been disabled, please instead accept these $50 gift certificates for each of our top competitors. I'm not saying I've stayed at that hotel, but I did go to Fantasy Con in Scarborough a few years ago, and sometimes on the dark nights, I find myself wondering if I'm still there. Anyway, terrifying subterranean windows painted shut, signal blocking hotels aside, the core horror here is one that speaks to an awful lot of us. This family are horrible, and sometimes we've shared space with this family. The relentless need to be entertained, the eyes wide but somehow unseeing headlong spring towards the next spectacle, the desire at 3am somewhere over the Atlantic to pick a fight with their twin sister. Like I say, I've shared space with this family. The bovine banal desire to consume, done, done and on to the next one, not because we're on a roll, but because the mouth is always open, the noise is always there, and the only thing we can do to stop ourselves screaming until our throats bleed is to consume something. Anything. Or at least that's what they look like from the outside. But when you've been one, you get the real reason why they're like this, when you've been a member of this family. Because they're angry. Because they're terrified. And when you're angry and terrified, odds are you also feel powerless. And what do we do when we feel powerless? Well, in the immortal words of one of the 21st century's most alarming philosophers, Frederick Willano Durst, we break stuff. Graham Greene's The Destructors, Donnie Darko, this story, all of them deal with the same thing from different angles. The unending horror of the lack of control. What happens when we look that in the eyes and what happens when that control pushes back? expertly written and expertly performed thank you both now the halloween parade that is a tradition i started a few years ago it's written by me it's narrated by me and it is me processing all the various pieces of horror media 
that have left an impression on me over the course of the year. The thing is, I don't tell you what they are. I just describe them. So if you want to guess, then you know where to find me. I'm on Twitter, or alternatively, I think there'll be a thread on the forums. And in about a week's time, I'll post the answers. Alternatively, if you want to subscribe to Patreon, the patrons will be getting the answers a little bit earlier if you're impatient. And there's nothing wrong with that every now and again. You get your seats for the parade good and early this year. It's a hot day, a little oppressive. Thunder, or the rumour of it, bunching your shoulders and making everyone hunker down a little, or perhaps a little more. The charo guy has your order, though, and you catch up and wish him well. He's doing fine. He gives you double. Tells you you may be needing them. This year, the parade doesn't just begin with the director. Oh, she's there, first. Gloved, suited, precision, machine-tooled heels that you suspect could sever a hydrogen atom if they so desired. But she's deep in animated conversation with the janitor. He has wild, flyaway hair, a big jaw, and an oddly graceful gait. It's as though Doc Brown's younger brother went into the service industry. As they get closer, you realise what's disturbing you. It's not just that this woman who... Over the years, you've come to view as the part of an inhuman authority you're allowed to comprehend is talking to this man. It's that she's talking to him as a friend. As an equal. A torch light flashes behind them. The janitor turns, gestures irritably for the young woman in their wake to hurry up. She's tall, pained, fit, but has had to pay for that fact. The weapon she carries shimmers as it moves. The idea of a gun. No, the discussion of the idea of a gun. The magnum variations. But as the gun remains fluid, she remains stoic, focused. A fractal rose blooms briefly over her head and then is gone. Behind her, a massive steam train looms out of the fog that you didn't notice roll in. It's battered and scarred, an angry bulldog of a thing, and all the more inspiring for those scars. The engine towers over you, three, four stories tall, and the men and women on it, ragtag fatigues, compressed air, pump-action weapons, haunted eyes, lock gaze with anyone who dares to challenge them. Behind it comes a service car and a carriage all crammed with people and belongings, all bursting with ugly, untidy, glorious life. Then there are the three men, all deep in discussion, or perhaps conflict. One, dressed like a ship's captain, what's hard to keep the others at distance, and the other two in particular, apart. They're in the middle of a blazing row, and for a second you see one of them suddenly, distinctly, starkly, vast and lidless as an eye. You blink again, and only the old man is there. He sees you. He smiles, and for a second... He's gone, and someone else is standing in his place. Someone taller. Someone oddly familiar. They smile, wave, and then everything's back to normal. Or almost normal. The old man, you notice, is beginning to slowly fade, and his two companions are hand in hand as he vanishes. Not comfortable. Not yet. But soon. Following them are a trio of women, deep in discussion, all completely unique in appearance and style and age, aside from one thing, authority. You can't take your eyes off them as they stride by, accompanied by the accoutrement of running a town like sentient streamers. Police, firefighters, dead bodies, lovers, vengeance. It's all here. Walking behind them also deep in conversation, this time with the blonde mage with the trench coat and the wandering eye, the man with the sentient tie sticks his hands in his pockets and smiles. Next to him, the blonde magician smiles too. This, for him, is going somewhere new, and new is almost always as good as different. At least at first. At least for a while. The air above them shimmers, and for the split second you can see it, a spaceship outlines itself like a roller blind, opening and closing. You're pretty sure you saw it. You're pretty sure you saw the crew wave. Buddy, though, he's much less certain, and he takes one of your charros as he proves his point. And then things get weird. 
You don't notice at first, but Buddy does. The men and women in slightly too precise summer gear, making their way through the crowd, one of them stumbling, putting a hand up not to steady themselves, but to their ear. To their ear, peace. It's okay, Buddy says. They're not looking for anyone. They're just establishing a perimeter. He grins, and it's wide and wild-eyed like everyone on the poster for his favourite movie, Summer School. Here we go. A veteran, and you can tell he's a veteran by the way he carries himself, walks down the middle of the street, map in one hand, flashlight in the other. He smiles absently, waves to the others. He's in animated conversation with the staff of a gas station, some of whom are definitely alive, some are, well, more negotiable on that front. They're forming a loose perimeter around him, weapons, spectral and real alike, all ready. Around them, two horseshoes of soldiers, one in uniform, one not. You can't make out the logo on their shoulders beyond a letter P on the far right, but you can see they're either protecting the gas station staff, or perhaps corralling them. Or perhaps both. And then the atrocities arrive. And Buddy hoots with joy. The lizard, the plague doctor, the stairs, the jukebox, the hotline, the light switch, the happily married and partially alive couple, the warden with the handcuffs both in and on his hands, normal objects, or normal shapes at least, curdled like milk left out just a little too long, their edges fuzzy, mobile, something pushing out from deep inside them. Oh, this is the good stuff. This is the good stuff. Right, there is the hiss of a taser. Buddy's face contorts and keeps contorting, the skin stretching sideways as though someone is grabbing and yanking, and he screams, or is it a laugh? There's a ripping noise, and you're alone. Just like you always are for the parade, but Charo's are gone faster than usual. It's been a rough year. You've been under stress, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, you think, and head up to get a new batch. The charo guy gives them to you on the house. You stand behind a soldier and he salutes you when he leaves. You can't see his unit badge, but it ends with a P. You sit back down just in time for the Swedes, each one happy and smiling, waving to the crowd in their bright clothes. At their centre, carried aloft on their shoulders, in fact, is an explosion of flowers with the face of a woman. She's gorgeous, and sad, and haggard, and somehow those three things are all wrapped around one another. There's a sense you get from her of resigned tranquility. This is not where she needs to be, but this is where she is, and that at least is enough. She pays no mind to the bear being carried behind her. No one notices when it twitches every now and then, when a sob echoes from somewhere near it, and the family following it in silent fervent worship. Perhaps because what follows them is the dead. And not just the usual dead, the ones fended off by a slightly different group of survivors every year. They're still here too. Some new faces, some missing. No, what follows behind them are the true dead. The victims. The bystanders. The narrative bricks and mortar whose degradation is someone else's character arc whose violent death provides the ink another's story is written in. You've never seen a group so large be so quiet, be so angry. They're shepherded along by two women. In the front, in an immaculate suit, could almost be the director, but she wears no gloves. Her bobbed brunette hair is loose, and she's constantly playing with a speed loader for her sidearm. Bracketing the dead, coming behind them, is the college student, Terrified, although she does shimmer like a heat haze, her outfit seeming to change decade a couple of times, and resolute, poker in one hand, other reaching out into the darkness, reaching for something certain, terrified of finding something, or someone that has been broken. She's lucky, the broken are out of reach, and very well dressed. Immaculate, if slightly dusty black, is the order of the day. And as you watch them dance their elaborate, maniacal, silent waltz, you're reminded of nothing more than a grandfather clock, going faster and faster, the cogs shaking in their housing until finally... Silence. Darkness. A spotlight. 
Two women, a complete set of arms between them, play the cello. Nearby, an individual with a glow that seems to come from within, not an external source, regales their girlfriend with the story of the city beneath the city they live in. A float follows them, a water tank filled to the brim with flood water and terror. In one corner, in an air pocket, a father contemplates what he'll have to lose to live. The alligators circling his daughter out in the main tank don't seem to care, and neither does she. Eyes wide and focused, she looks like one of them, an apex predator. No one's victim. And then the music hits, and the impala makes its turn. The brothers in the front, the angel and demon as ever in the back, the family walking on either side of them in an arrowhead, behind which a thousand kids dance and sing with wild, defiant, feverish energy. Some of them are already bloody. Some of them are already dead. Others soon follow. It doesn't matter. Neither do the carols or what looks like a Santa chasing them down. They're living for the moment, so all of us can live for the moment. And behind them, as inevitable as the tides, the director. This time, somehow in lockstep with the young woman and the notional gun. They're even dressed alike now, moving alike, waving to you with the same offhand casual interest. The parade leaves, and after a little set-up, a man with amazing hair and a skull mask begins playing music and handing out download codes. You grab one and say goodbye to the charo guy and the soldier who is watching you a little too closely and head home. As you get to your car, you realise the passenger seat's warm, almost like someone was sitting there. It must have been the sun. You blink. You think for a second that there is a laugh echoing around the car, one you know and yet one you've never heard before. And then you drive off. Time to go home. Happy Halloween, everyone. We rely on you to pay for basically everything. Our server costs, our authors, our staff, and recently those costs have had to spike. They've spiked for really good reasons. The SFWA have raised the qualifying rate for professional sales from six cents to eight cents a word. That's fine. Honestly, it's years overdue, but that cost when spread across four shows publishing weekly balloons we have spent this year campaigning to try and raise the extra money to get back to that qualifying rate and we are very close relatively speaking and that's because of the tireless work of our staff in promoting this and of you in shipping in i know times are hard i know everyone in this industry always seems to have their cap in their hand but i also know this is a righteous cause Authors deserve to be paid for their work. And we're not just using this money for that. We're also using it to pay our associate editors and to become one of the first markets in the field that does when that finally happens. Associate editors, for those of you who do not know, are slush readers. These are the people who are the first point of contact between every magazine and every possible author. They deal with everything, they do so tirelessly, they do so without any praise, and they do so without any pay, and I want to do something about that. So, if you can, and if you want to help us pay these amazing people, please go to pseudopod.org and click on Feed the Pod, uh, or alternatively go to Patreon and subscribe there. For as little as five bucks a month, you get access to a ton of extra audio stuff, and you get us a little bit closer do please help out if you can and if you can't donate then please donate some time uh, boost a signal leave a review either on google or itunes um, tweet about us link to us any of that stuff please help out if you can folks we'll be back next week with episode 674 that will be dust by rebecca lloyd audio produced by the amazing chelsea and narrated by the wonderful Catherine inskip then as now we will be a production of escape artists incorporated and released under a creative commons attribution non-commercial no derivatives license and i leave you with this the single transcendentally wonderful joke from the first hotel transylvania movie zombie beethoven any progress uh, 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 uh. i regret nothing See you next week, folks. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.